welcome podcast fans to this bonus episode of Pod World that we call My Favourite Podcast. I'm David Mar Roberts and if you listen to the regular show you will know that Pod World is all about helping you discover great podcasts. In the show we pick a category and go deep to recommend the podcasts you should be listening to. But in these bonus episodes, we take a very different route to a podcast recommendation. We chat with a content creator, musician or an author, and we ask them about their relationship with podcasts and which ones are important to them. And for this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by a comedian, an author, an LGBTQ plus activist and podcast host from Toronto, Canada. Welcome to Podworld, Jordan Power. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. I've teed you up there with quite a few facets of your life and what you do. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I, I gained, I've only really been in the entertainment business uh, for about two years. I gained notoriety with a podcast I used to have called Shame on You. And it was two best friends on a journey to eradicate any residual shame we had about our sexuality. And so the way that we approached that was sort of just uh, shining a light on it, putting it all out there um, and being very disinhibited, inhibited, particularly sexually. Um, and we interviewed a lot of the people we dated and, you know, hookups, and we really took risks that other people hadn't taken. And it sort of um, sparked this uh, movement among people, which we, we really didn't plan on, but um, the podcast was downloaded of a million times. We had uh, people come out of the closet. We had a priest come out of the closet. We had guys li leave their wives, leave abusive relationships. And I think the idea was we went so far uh, with the podcast and, the areas that we weren't normally broadcast to people that it sort of inspired uh, something among people. The idea being that if we went a thousand feet, they could take one foot. Uh, absolutely. That's one of the things we know about podcasts. It's so intimate and the effect you can have on people is extremely powerful. I mean, a million downloads is huge. Yeah. And, and a large percentage of the audience what was interesting was a large percentage of the audience was from countries in which it was illegal to be gay. So we would receive emails from uh, the Middle East, Chechnya, just all these crazy different places. And they would say, you know, if anyone find, found this on my phone, um, I would be harmed in some way. And so what's so cool about podcasting, uh, not just the fact that there's not so many constraints in place like mainstream media, but also the fact that it's very authentic. And it was really just two best friends in my co-host's apartment um, getting drunk or hang, just hanging out like it was like a little party. And um, it was amazing to see how fast it organically grew. I mean, we didn't do an ad campaign. It was just this uh, word of mouth kind of thing that every week our audience just kept doubling and doubling, and doubling. And we only did the podcast for 16 months, but um, we grew it from absolutely nothing to this massive audience. And what was interesting also is a huge percentage of the audience was straight people. Uh, because comedy is such a unifier and I think among straight people they learned empathy for um, for us and they learned what we still went through uh, in 2020 what we were still going through the the hurdles that we still had to jump through and how much progress hadn't been made and it has led to other things your first podcast I think led to a book is that right yeah so I actually always use the uh podcast is sort of a jumping platform to write a book. I was a published writer for a decade. Uh, I always knew I wanted to write a book, but I knew I had to sort of harness a fan base from nothing to then promote the book or get a large advance for the book. And so I used that to build the audience. And then I leveraged that into releasing my book last summer, which is called Famous Anus. And it's sort of a <laughs> decade long uh, memoir uh, where it's sort of this descent into chaos and uh, the modern gay man just finding himself. And it's raunchy and it's real, but it also really shows me growing as a human being. Um, and you sort of see that arc through the book as you sort of see, I start at 23 and then it comes to current day. And you see a person who really becomes a lot more comfortable with himself uh, and understanding my place in the world and who I am. Um, and then uh, the podcast itself, well, after the book came out, the podcast itself ended um, for a lot of reasons, uh, particularly because my friendship had declined as a result of the podcast, but also that I just wasn't that interested in doing a singular theme podcast. I also personally became radioactive. People didn't want to date me because I was largely talking about my dating life and I was... Yeah, it was mining my personal life for content. I don't think people t realize what that does to your life and you always feel like you're on display and you have to produce content. Well, that content is very much uh, something entertaining and, and you, you become the product to people. Yeah, which can be dangerous if you also want to have a life. 
there are so many YouTubers who have become the product themselves and have suffered from that. There's no doubt. It might make them successful in one way, but it does make them miss out on on other things. Yeah, I, I, and I understand also from the feedback from people who who wanted to avoid me because I was in in essence recapping my life every week and people didn't want to be a show and even if I would tell them you know that I would never share this this wouldn't be public um, the pressure of knowing that there were thousands of people just in their hometown uh, listening to the show it just really drove a lot of people away from me so um, I then decided that I did not want to do just a gay specific podcast so after I finished the book released it got a lot of great feedback I started my current podcast which is called unmentionable and it's sort of a, a takeoff of the old show and that when you're gay you sort of feel like a misfit and you live on the outskirts of society and I've always been interested in what I think is traditionally the seedy underbelly of society the people you don't normally hear from unmentionable the people you shouldn't hear from and so those are the voices that I elevate on my new show um, and it's obviously a comedy show, but it allows, I have a lot more breadth and depth to my show and I, it's a lot more open and I don't really talk about my personal life that much, particularly when it comes to sex or relationships. So you've done a lot of podcasting, you know how to tell stories. So what is your relationship like with podcasts and podcasting? Have you found inspiration in other podcasts? Give, give us a sense of what you listen to and what your influences are. Well, when I seek out, I, I, so just looking at my background, I mean, I worked in different extensions of the media for about a decade of my life. I was a publicist, I was a radio producer, I was a telev television producer, and I felt the constraints within those things and that uh, certain messages couldn't get out or that you had to be constrained by time or that you, you know, couldn't touch certain subjects, you couldn't touch risque subjects. And I think my previous show filled that void and then it was real it was like drinks with friends over martinis and so the kind of podcasts that I gravitate towards are what I find live outside the mainstream media um, and uh, the kind of shows that I mean of my generation we are a, I'm a millennial but we're a generation largely that grew up in ideological silos and that we only take in certain information and confirmation bias and um, it's led to this intense tribalism that we experience in society. So what I try to do with my show is I try to explore, um, I try to give people something that's that's measured. Uh, I t I'm someone who takes in conservative media. I'm also a person who takes in liberal media. And I think when you take in a lot of those things, you can then distill it and kind of come up with uh, somewhere in the middle or sort of a free thinker approach. So um, I, I, I got a lot of that through Joe Rogan, but the podcast that I personally have really loved is Jimmy Jimmy Dore show. Get ready for an outstanding entertainment program. The Jimmy Dore show. Hey, this is Jimmy. Who's this? Jimmy baby, it's double V. Oh, hi, Hollywood conservative Vince Vaughn. How are you? Uh, you know what, Jimmy? Actually, I'm a libertarian who lives in <laughs> Chicago. So maybe that would be a way to refer to me. Uh, is, is that an idea I could possibly submit to you, you insufferable Democrat elitist? I'm not a Democrat, Vince. I think what's interesting about Jimmy is he's someone that just skewers the left and he's someone that skewers the right. And he's he's gotten us back to that place where we just sort of have the news, right? We were at a time where, you know, you watch Fox News, it's editorialized. You watch CNN, it's editorialized, where he's someone that just sort of looks at each situation and is willing to criticize the left and the right. but more particularly willing to criticize their own. And that's a big problem in society now is that uh, people think if they criticize, say they're a liberal and they criticize Joe Biden, that they're losing power, that their group is losing power. And so they play this game where someone will criticize Biden and the person will say, well, yeah, what about Trump? And we've gotten to this place where we can't just criticize the powerful and the elites. So what I like about Jimmy is he sort of just criticizes everyone. And, you know, he has really interesting messaging that used to kind of be common that isn't anymore. I mean, anti-war, uh, anti-big pharma. I mean, it's interesting now you have political parties and even CNN where you are watching these shows and they're still they're very similar. They're they're still pro mil military industrial complex. They're still pro war. They still do the bidding of their advertisers, and I that's what I love about podcasts, and particularly Jimmy, is that he just sort of gives you exactly how it is. Um, he doesn't have an agenda. 
Um, he's funded by sort of small donations and YouTube monetization. And it's very real and data driven. And it just feels like I'm having a, a smart, credible friend give me the information. Yeah, and that's the thing. The polarization of being in our camps and you can't criticize anything. But how did we get there? I mean, there was a time not so long ago that you could meet up with your friends for a drink and have a reasonable discussion. You would learn something maybe from them, even if you didn't agree with them. And you could also question something they might have said without being attacked for daring to ask a question or give a different opinion. But how did we get here? Is, is it all because of media and social media? Yeah, and it's a curated reality, right? Um, so social media, it basically serves you the most extreme form of confirmation bias. You follow people you agree with. They confirm your biases. You have one narrative. You never leave the chamber. And it's only gotten worse and worse and to the point where everyone just wants to tear each other's throats apart. And I don't think that's a productive society. I mean, traditionally, when you look at history, when people can't speak, when people cannot exchange ideas, then violence starts to result. And you're seeing a lot of that happening now. And so I, I'm very much with my show, no matter who I'm criticizing, my effort is to dampen down the rhetoric, dampen down the temp temperature in society right now. And whether that's, uh, you know, the authoritarian vibes of, say, a Trump um, that I have an aversion to. But also, you know, you look at someone like AOC, um, that's a person who still has authoritarian vibes, who does not have an, a bipartisan interest, who wants to keep lists of people that agreed with Trump. Um, it's just different shades of these things. And so I really try to gravitate towards people that want to unify, want to exchange ideas. I don't feel like other people that disagree with me, that they're a threat to me. I also don't feel that by yelling in people's faces or trying to censor them or remove them from social media, I don't think that's productive. I think it emboldens them. And I also think when you look at Trump, you know, they're creating a political martyr out of him through Silicon Valley. And I don't think people realize how, where that could go. And then I won't be surprised when we get another despotic leader that comes forth. Yeah, I agree. Deplatforming or cancelling is just not going to help. History has shown us that once you stop people having a voice, there are usually negative consequences of some kind. So is, is that your favorite podcast at the moment? I would say right now, that's because it's sort of the only place I can go to find a level of sanity. Um, you know, he's a, he's a very progressive left person, but um, he brings in a level of sanity. I mean, I consider myself sort of a disaffected liberal um, in that I'm a classic liberal. I've always been liberal, but um, where the far left is going right now, I think only is going to embolden the right. And so um, I very much look to someone like him uh, to sort of tell my group what we're doing wrong and where we're heading and how we're playing into the hand of of uh, the right wing. But if I had to say another podcast that I particularly enjoy, um, I you know, not to sound sort of like everyone else, but I would say the same sort of mentality is like a Joe Rogan um, in that he just simply is a regular guy in a room talking to people across all you know shades political affiliations and i think he's such a lesson for the mainstream media right now because if two people in a room can get 20 times the audience of cnn then something is being missed there and people crave authenticity i don't think people deep down crave combative news i don't think people really want to watch people go in the news and fight each other and yell at each other I think they, at their core, just want to say, I'm worried about the economy. I want a, a certain level of adequate health care. Um, and so I would say like that, those are the kind of shows I gravitate towards. Uh, and, and also particularly anything with Glenn Greenwald where he's on the show. I mean, my favorite episode of Jimmy Dore is with Glenn Greenwald because Glenn Greenwald is, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter that just takes down everyone. I mean, that is the role of the journalist nowadays to criticize everyone, not just who you agree with. So those are the kind of people I like, free thinkers, independent, intrepid sort of people that host shows. And I think those are the people that are gonna bring us back to a level of normalcy, not the type of shows like CNN and Fox News. I do think those are destructive forces in society. And I do think they're purveyors of misinformation in a lot of ways. And I think also what I, what I try to do with my show and what these shows do well, and I, I work really hard at this, is I think people need to always stop seeing everything as always a left and right approach and that your neighbor, you and your neighbor have a lot more in common than you realize. You both want to take care of your families and healthcare and the economy. 
But looking at it through the prism of left and right is very intense tribalism and it ramps up the rhetoric. Whereas I sort of look at society as sort of a top down approach, meaning the privileged and the elite and the ruling class versus the rest of us. And that they love these sort of fights between left and right because they distract from the real problems in them hoarding their wealth overseas and getting us into wars that don't matter and all these different problems that are the real rod of society. And when you are completely, you know, nowadays, Generation D Z specifically, their whole identity is wrapped up in their political affiliations. I mean, you, look, you go on their Twitter bio and it's not about their hobbies or what's interesting about them or their job. It's just you read the Twitter bio and they let you know exactly who they are. Um, leftist, BLM, blah, blah, blah. And on the right as well, too. And it's become this uniform thought uh, that I find is really destructive and no one's talking to each other. And I, I think it's only going to get worse unless we sort of gravitate towards these sort of platforms. And do you think that podcasts at the moment have more of these personalities? And so do you see a time when the mainstream media might pick up on the fact that someone like Joe has 20 times bigger audience than the than their own shows? There seems to be no self-reflection as to why they all are failing. Um, they And I think there's a hubris, I think, especially on the left. It's what is liberalism now is West Coast elite New York Times sort of liberalism. So it's very much why Trump won, because you're hearing from Hollywood and millionaires why people how people should think where working class people are completely and utterly forgotten. So I do think those shows the, the problem they're up against is how can you really criticize uh, Big Pharma when those are your sponsors? How can you really take on climate change when you're funded by BP? I mean, the climate change situation, I talk about it a lot on my show, is completely so dire. People have no idea how bad it is. I mean, we're going to run out of natural resources that fuel our entire economy within my lifetime. And that is something that's not explored on CNN. That's not explored on Fox News. So I hope these independent creators sort of continue to grow. And I always encourage people to support content. I mean, if you want good content, it's not free. Pay the Substack money or pay the money to the Patreon. Support this content or it will be gone. Yeah. Well, on that note, I totally agree with you. Supporting independent content creators is so critical. Before we go, where can people follow you and keep in touch with everything you're doing? Uh, yeah, so sure. My Instagram is at jpowercomedy. I'm more active on there than Twitter, but my Twitter is the same handle. And then my show comes out every Friday, unmentionable on all podcast players. And then we also put the show on YouTube. Jordan, thank you so much for the insight and for telling us your story and sharing your favorite podcast with us. And best of luck with the book and the new podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Podworld is produced and edited by Louise Blaine and myself, DMR. Design is by Dylan Channon. Our researcher is LMR Roberts. And the music was composed by Dan Philipson. Stay in touch with us via our website, podworld.fm, or follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at podpodworld.com.